بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومن محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومن محمد وبارك وسلم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last weekend we were speaking of various aspects spanning from what is Yawm Al-Qiyamah, kind of the idea behind it, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made such a system. And then going into the various phases, we did a very brief overview of what to expect. And then we started talking about how Yawm Al-Qiyamah will begin, and that is through the trumpet, the sul. It will be blown into, the world will be destroyed, uh, the mountains, the earth, all of that will be like leveled out. It'll be a very flat plain for people to uh, gather on. Uh, people will be dead and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a rain and then it will cause their bodies to regrow. And then the, the second blow of the trumpet will signal the beginning of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Then all the souls will go into the bodies and then they will come out of their graves. And they'll be on this, you know, the very white and large area. And uh, we also spoke of various ways people will be brought back, resurrected, in different shapes, different forms, based off of how they live their lives. We also discussed the difficulties on the plains of Yom al Qiyamah, which include uh, people drowning in their sweat or their sweat reaching various levels. Uh, also, the fact that Jannah and Jahannam will be visible. Jahannam will be closer. It will actually speak to people. It will take people inside itself. Um, and we talked about the duration of Yom Al-Qiyamah, 50,000 years. Half of that will be standing, which is 25,000 years. Uh, and time is relative according to a person's actions. So for some people, that will be less. For some people, it will be more um, we, we talked about various things. And then we talked about uh, the lake fount of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Hawb. And he will be by the Hawb. And who will be allowed to drink from that water and the description of the Hawb. So that is where we left off. <laughs> now we have a little bit more to recap from last year. And that is in regards to the intercession, which is called Shafa'a. In Arabic, Shafa'a means to take something lesser and attach it to something greater. So kind of to lift something up that is lesser to a greater. And what it actually is, is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's creation. And so everything is lesser than Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ultimately dependent on his intercession. So everything else is lesser. They will be able to benefit from his high status and that is why it's called a shafa'ah. So taking something lesser and attaching it to something greater. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran in, in Ayat al-Kursi, Man illa bi Who could possibly intercede with Allah without Allah's permission? So you need Allah's permission to intercede. Intercede meaning you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help others out. And in what regard, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will do this for us. We're going to look at how this intercession works or you know this this begging of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for another person's sake that's what intercession is where you're not asking for anything for yourself you're asking for someone else and you can you have this capability because you're close to the one that you need to ask for instance you're in school or you're in a madrasa setting and you have your shaykh and your shaykh he is very close to you because you're a really good student you do everything the shaykh says. You never disobey the shaykh. You do some khidmah and service to the shaykh. Your scores are really good. So one day the shaykh gets angry at several students in the class. And they're, they are your friends. So you want to help them out. Now, if they go and speak to the shaykh, the shaykh is going to be really upset with that. He's going to say, you know, don't talk to me. Uh, you're suspended from class. I don't want to see your face for another two weeks due to such and such thing that you've done. You've done an egregious crime. You lack adab and respect. I don't want to see you. So now this student is very depressed. You, on the other hand, are very close to the sheikh. So you could actually go and talk to the sheikh. You say, oh, sheikh. He says, 
Assalamu alaikum, how are you doing? And he has a smile on when he sees you. So you say, you know, please, can you allow him back? He didn't mean what he said or did. He's very regretful. He's, he's, he's crying, this and this. You explain all of this. Then the sheikh said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say. Because of your position with the teacher, your closeness to him, you have that capability. Whereas the one who is in the anger of the teacher can't do that. So similarly, this is something that's going to happen on Yom Al-Qiyamah. No one will dare speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or request anything from him because they're just too afraid. Only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will have this capability. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is truly a blessing. He has been given so many different you know, ni'mas and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Kawthar, Allah says, Inna a'atayna kal-kawthar. We've given you a lot of great benefits. Part of that is the, the lake and the river of Kawthar. And then we talked about the banner of praise, liwa ul hamd. There's a flag of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And many different other things. This is one of them. The shafa'a is one of the blessings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give to him. And he won't give to anyone else. And uh, it's, it's a very amazing thing that is going to occur. And we're all dependent on this shafa'a. Um, and another thing that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is given is something called wasila. Every time you hear the adhan, you make dua that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives him wasila. That's the dua of the adhan. You're, you're asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to give him maqam mahmud and give him wasila. So some interpretations state that maqam mahmud and the wasila is actually the shafa'a itself. The maqam mahmud is a shafa'a and some state that the wasila is a level in Jannah. A position in Jannah that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have. Now we're going to talk about the Shafa'a. There's two types of Shafa'a. There is the greater or the grand Shafa'a, and then there are the lesser Shafa'as. We start with the Shafa'atul Uthma, which is the, the grand intercession. So what is this? This is a gift given only to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As I have stated, it's called Al Maqamul Mahmud. Every time we hear the Adhan, we make a dua if you can recall that dua, you'll hear the words Maqam Mahmud. That means the praised position, and it's a reference to the Shafa'a. So what is the Shafa'a? The Shafa'a is to take people from the situation that they're in. That's what we've been discussing before. People are going to be resurrected on the plains of Yom Al-Qiyamah, and it's going to be very difficult. Not for everyone, you know, the pious, those close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll experience a very short period of time. And they will be under shade. They will have reclining chairs. They're going to be relaxing. But those are a select few. But the vast majority are going to experience this as thousands of years. And they're going to sweat because the sun is going to be brought very near to them. Some say one mile above their head. But they can't die. So they're going to sweat so profusely that some of them will be swimming or drowning in their own sweat. It's going to be extremely hot. Jahannam will be visible. People will be criticizing one another, seeing one another. They're going to be going through a lot. So they want this to stop. They're desperate in this situation. To stop this and start the actual reckoning, to start Yom Al-Qiyamah, you know, the purpose of Qiyamah. Everyone knows at that time, even the kuffar, atheists and everything, they know what's going to happen. They know that there is going to be a judgment. The angel... Uh, Israfil, he already makes that declaration. He's the da'i, the caller. So they want to get it started. Stop this situation. We're in a very desperate situation. Just start what's supposed to happen. And that is where they go to, ultimately they go to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They ask him to start it. And this is the dua he makes. No one else can do it. No one else can actually start the shifa. Or I should say start the Yom Al-Qiyamah, the hisab. The reckoning. That's the main portion of Yom Al-Qiyam. So that is what's called a Shafa'atul Uzma, or the Grand Intercession. Then later we'll talk about lesser intercessions. That is when someone says, oh Allah, forgive this relative of mine, or Allah, this person did good to me, you know, they're in a difficult situation, please help them out. And many different people will be able to do that. But that's the lesser intercession. But the Grand Intercession can only be done by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, verse 79, 
wa min al-layli fatahajjad bihi nafilatan lak asa an yab'athaka rabbuka maqaman mahmuda rise in the last portion of the night this is an address to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam perform the salatu tahajjud as an optional prayer nafal and if you do this perhaps allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you the praised position so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to work for it and he did he he's going to receive the maqam mahmud but here in the ayah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you have to do a lot of salah you have to strive and you will get this now think about this for a second you and i do good deeds for who and for what we do whatever good deeds we do as paltry and scarce as they are for ourselves we're always you know we're coming for tarawih we're standing in the qiyam al layl we're fasting i'm not doing this for anyone else you know my my parents they're fasting for themselves they're standing for themselves my spouse my child my brothers my you know everyone they're doing it for themselves and i'm doing it for myself and that's all of humanity rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam however Look at the the way the ayah is 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 talking to him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if you want the ultimate desire of yours, you know you have this desire, and this this is like the pinnacle. You have to strive for that. You have to do a lot of amal for that. And what is that? Is it for his own benefit? He doesn't benefit from doing the shifa. He he doesn't need it. He's already forgiven. He's already having the, the highest stage in the hereafter. The thing that he wants most is to help humanity. He's selfless. He really is selfless. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, if you really want this, and this is like the greatest desire that you have, pray a lot, perform a lot of salah. And that's why you see Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performing so much that his, his uh, heels, his ankles, his feet would blister. And he would still be standing in salah. He's doing it not for himself. He doesn't need to. He's doing it for you and I. This is very, you know, it should create some level of love for him. If you think about it, he's not doing it for himself. And so this is, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala will give him this. And you and I make du'a for this. Essentially, you know, after the adhan, if you look at the translation of that du'a, many of you know the du'a, and we should, we should memorize this du'a. We should recite this du'a every time you hear the adhan. So we're asking Allah, give him the maqam Mahmud. Give him the wasila. So it sounds like we're, we're making dua for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You're actually making dua for yourself. If he has the maqam Mahmud, who benefits? You and I. So when we make that dua, we're saying, oh Allah, give him the maqam Mahmud, but ultimately, you and I benefit from it. So now I'm going to share with you the hadith of the shafa'ah. This is a very lengthy hadith. And uh, in it, we see many different things happening. Inshallah, we can draw some lessons from it. So I'm just going to be uh, reading various ahadith, inshallah. So this is leading up to the grand intercession. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, this is reported in Sahih Bukhari. He says, on the day of resurrection, the people will fall on their knees out of desperation, out of fear. And every nation will follow their prophet and they will say, oh, so-and-so, intercede for us with Allah. Until the intercession is given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that day will be the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the station of Maqam Mahmud. So that's a very brief version of the entire story um, regarding the Maqam Mahmud. Now as I mentioned, right now you should imagine the people on the Mawqif. The Mawqif is the place of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the white land. Uh, that's the Mawqif. So people are there still. We didn't move beyond that. We just talked about the hold of Kothar. So that is uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Now, Abu Hurairah, anhu, he said that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is for every prophet a prayer which is granted. And every prophet showed haste in his prayer. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has promised every single Nabi that there's a special dua that you are guaranteed. Like, you are guaranteed that dua. You don't have to hope. Of course, the Nabi's duas are accepted. Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, their duas are accepted. But there's a chance it's not going to be accepted. Right? There's a chance it won't be accepted. But there's one dua given to every Nabi that it will be accepted, no matter what. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasalam said, every previous Nabi, they made the dua in the dunya. They did it. And so some of them are mentioned in the Quran. 
like Nuh salam asked for the uh, the flood. That was his dua. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues, this hadith is in Bukhari Muslim. He says, I have, however, reserved my prayer for the intercession of my ummah on the day of resurrection. And it will be granted if Allah so wills to everyone amongst my ummah, provided they die without associating any partner with Allah. So here Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is stating, if you are a believer, you die with the shahadatain, the kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, he is going to be making a dua for you. And ultimately, even the kuffar, because you know they want the intercession to start. But notice here his selflessness. He could have made this dua, but he didn't. He reserved it for another realm, the hereafter. Every other Nabi made the dua in the, in the dunya. He reserved it for the akhirah. So now, uh, on another hadith, he says, I shall be the leader of mankind on the day of resurrection. Do you know why Allah would gather in one plane the early and latter generations of the human race? Then the voice of the angel will be heard by all of them, and their eyesights, the eyesight would penetrate through all of them, and the sun would come near. He's talking about the motif. So the angel, we talked about Israfil, he's going to make an announcement. Everyone stand up for your Lord. Everyone's going to come out of the graves. And then when someone speaks, there's different ahadith about this that you will be able to hear someone if they want to talk to you, but you won't necessarily be able to, to see them. There's various ahadith about that. The sun is going to be really near to people's head. He continues, people will then experience a degree of anguish, anxiety, and agony, which they shall not be able to bear, and they shall not be able to stand. So eventually, people just cannot bear this anymore. It's just they've reached their possible limit. So he continues, this is the long hadith of Shafa'ah, that's how it starts. Some people will say to others, do you not see what misfortune has overtaken you? Why don't you find someone who can intercede for you with your Lord? So they start planning. The people of Qiyamah, they're undergoing all these difficulties. They meet one another and they're, they're asking, like, you know, this is just too much. It's hard for us to bear this. It's hot. Nothing's happening. They're not allowed to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not allowed to talk to Allah. They're not told anything. There's not like an angel you can go, like a security guard, like, hey, you know, can we get some information? Like, what's happening here? No one's there. No one's saying anything. So then they start making mashwara with one another, taking consultation from one another. So one person says, hey, let's go find someone who can do something about this. Let's go get help. Some others will say, you have to go to Adam. Go to Adam alayhi salam. It's probably those atheists today, they'll say, instead of uh, King Kong, go to Adam alayhi salam. Right? Instead of a monkey, go to Adam alayhi salam. They, they all agree on that day that we didn't come from a, you know, apes and you know, primates. So go to Adam alayhi salam. And they will go to Adam alayhi salam and say, oh Adam, you are the father of mankind. So imagine, there's a group of people. So Allahu alam how they all get together. But of course, there'll be someone with leadership capabilities and he'll tell people, hey, let's do something about this. This is carrying on too much. We can't handle this. So they go to Adam and Islam. They say, oh, Adam, you are the father of mankind. Allah created you with his own hand and breathed in you of his spirit and ordered the angels to prostrate before you. All of these things, when it talks about Allah's attributes, we don't you know, try to picture Allah. That's one thing I want to state because in the Yawmul Qiyamah, there will be certain things where we're going to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The belief of Muslims is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't resemble his creation. So when you say, when you hear like Allah created him with his hand, it's not like this, like our hands. Allah is not a, a physical, you know, creature. He's a creator of time and space, meaning he's not contained with time and space. So these are figures of speech. You should understand that going forward. So anyway, he says, Adam alayhi was a special servant of Allah. He was created without parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him directly. He's very noble. Let's go to him. So then, and even the angels did sujood to Adam. They'll go to Adam alayhi salam. They'll say, intercede for us with your Lord. Just make a dua. Like you can do something. If anybody, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you special. And you're our father. You are the original human. Do you not see what dire situation we're in? Do you not see what misfortune has overtaken us? So they'll beg him. So Adam alayhi what is his response? 
to say, my Lord is angry on this day. To such an extent that he's never been this angry before, never will he be angry afterward like this. The anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attribute of Allah, of his wrath, is at a degree today that I've never seen before. Again, I'm going to reiterate this. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has like a, you know, he's like you and I when we get angry. He doesn't resemble us. But anyway, saying Allah's wrath today is on such a level, I've never experienced this. And then Adam Alayhisam said, he forbade me to go near the tree and I disobeyed him. And he says, myself, myself, myself. I'm worried about myself today. Go to someone else. Go to Nuh. So at least Adam Alayhi he gives them some type of mashwara, some type of thing that they can do. But he says, ultimately, Adam Alayhi and the Anbiya Alayhi are selfless. They're selfless individuals. But on Yom al Qiyamah, can you imagine what situation must be there for a Nabi to, to say something like this? Say, myself, myself, a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, go to Nuh. In another narration, Adam alayhi says, go to Nuh. He's the first messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the people of earth. Meaning a rasul, like with the kitab. There's a difference between a rasul and a nabi. So Adam alayhi is saying, Nuh is very special. He's the first rasul. So they go to Nuh alayhi They find him, this group. They say, oh Nuh, you are the first of the messengers sent on earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called you Abadan Shakura, a grateful servant in the Quran. Intercede for us with your Lord. Just help us out. Do you not see what dire situation we're in? He will say, Verily, my Lord is angry on this day as he had never been angry before and would never be angry afterwards. And then he says, There had emanated a curse from me with which I cursed my people. So Nuh will say that I'm scared because. I made a dua cursing my people. And they ultimately, you know, humanity died except for those on the ship. And then he says, I'm concerned with only myself. Nafsi, 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 what he'll say. Nuh alayhi salam. And then he says, go to someone other than me. Go to Ibrahim. And in another narration, he says, go to Ibrahim. Allah has taken him as a khalil and an intimate friend. So you can't, I can't do anything for you. I'm just worried about myself. If, and remember that analogy that I made with the students and the teacher. If someone is in a bad position, they can't intercede. So all of these Anbiya alayhi salatu salam, they're scared for themselves. So they're, they're worried about themselves. Someone worried about themselves cannot intercede on behalf of someone else. So that's why he's saying, go to Ibrahim. He is the Khalil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they'll go to Ibrahim السلام, and say, Oh Ibrahim, you're the Prophet of Allah and his close friend, his Khalil. Amongst all of the people of earth, you are the Khalil of Ar-Rahman. Intercede for us with Allah. Don't you see our situation? We're in desperation right now. We have no direction. Allah's not talking to us. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and it's just really difficult. So Ibrahim السلام, will say to them, my Lord is angry on this day as he had never been before and never will be after. That the wrath of Allah on this day is something else. And I have spoken three mistruths. He says three mistruths. And he says, nafsi, 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 myself, myself, myself. Go to someone other than me. Go to Musa. I will talk about you know, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. What was the things that he said? He didn't speak lies. He just bent the truth, meaning like someone was asking him something. He intended something else. I'll tell you that uh, he told the people or the people invited him to go worship idols. He said, I'm sick. I'm not going to join you. He wasn't physically sick. He was feeling spiritually ill. So he said, I'm sick. So I cannot join you. So that something like that. The second one, with the idol, you guys know when he went into their... Uh, you know, the, their uh, temple. And he destroyed all the miniature idols and he hung the axe on the large one. And then when they asked him, this is in Surah Al-Anbiya, we're going to be reciting it tomorrow. They asked him about it. He said, go ask the big one. He has an axe around his neck. He did it. So this is a sarcasm. He's not literally saying the big one did it. It's not a real lie. And then the third one where 
Sara alayhi salam, she was taken by the uh, Egyptian ruler and he wanted to do it like it was known that he would kidnap a person's wife, but he would leave a sister alone. So if you were to come into Egypt, there would be like guards and stuff like that. And they would see if this is your wife, the king would take her to establish his authority. And if it was your sister, he'd leave her, leave her alone. So then when, when he came into Egypt, he said, this is my sister. It was about his wife. And he met sister in Islam. So he's not lying. So these are the three things that he said. But he's scared about it. He's scared. So he says, go to Musa alayhi salam. And another narration says, go to Musa who Allah spoke with directly. And he gave him the Torah. The very noble Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah spoke to him directly. Musa taklima. So they go to Musa alayhi salam. They say, oh Musa, you're Allah's messenger. Allah blessed you with his messengership. He gave you his kalam. He spoke to you directly. Intercede for us. We're in a very desperate situation. What will Musa salam say? He says, my Lord is angry on this day as he's never been before and never will be after. I killed a person. I was not supposed to kill him. Nafsi, 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 myself. Go to someone else. Go to Isa. So we know the story of Musa salam. He didn't do it on purpose. He punched a guy. Musa salam hit him to prevent him from harming the, the Israeli and the Skipti died because of the strength of Musa. He didn't intend to kill. It was not a sin. He says, go to Isa. So now they go to Isa. And they say, oh Isa, you are the messenger of Allah. You are the word of Allah, which he sent down upon Maryam. You are a spirit from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you as a spirit without the means of a father inside Maryam alayhi salam. You spoke to people as a baby in the cradle. So many miracles of Isa alayhi salam. Intercede for us with, with your Lord. You certainly are of a high stature. Do you not see our desperation today? Isa alayhi salam will say, my Lord is angry on this day as he's never been before nor after. And Isa alayhi salam doesn't mention the sin though. He doesn't mention any kind of action that he did wrong. He just says, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Go to someone other than me. But in another narration, not in this one, it says, Isa salam will say, go to Muhammad. He is a slave who has been forgiven by Allah, his past and his future sins. Whatever he's done, he has not sinned, but hypothetically, his past, future, everything's forgiven. This is a very noble slave of Allah. You need to go to Muhammad. And in another narration, in Sahih Muslim, it says, they will come to Isa alayhi salam and he will say, I'm not the one for this. Go to Muhammad. You have to go find Muhammad. And in another narration of Imam Ahmad and Nasai ibn Abbas, he says, Isa alayhi salam will say, like, what was his fault that he's so scared about? I've been taken as a god other than Allah. These Christians have taken me as a god. They worship me. I'm scared about this. So I cannot help you today. Yet in another narration, he says, all of the prophets will say, nothing matters to me today other than myself. All from Adam salam, to Isa, salam, all the prophets that they go to, these Anbiya alayhi salatu will say, nothing matters but myself. I mean, it's just the, the gravity of the situation. If we can only imagine that a prophet, Anbiya alayhi salatu will salam, love us more than our parents. Parents sometimes leave their children. Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, will never leave anyone of the ummah. They love them. And in another narration, it says, all of the prophets will say, if I'm forgiven today, that's enough for me. They're just caring about themselves. But it's not selfishness. This is a natural state that a human has, a you know, fight or flight or defensive situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in human beings. They did one single thing wrong and they're terrified. Imagine how many wrongs we've done on a day, just today itself. Just today itself, you've done much more wrong than any Nabi. All together. Take all the Anbiya, all of these people are talking about. Because these weren't actually sins. They're like mistakes. You and I do blatant sin. One day. Probably one hour of our life is worse than, you know, you cannot find this in the life of a Nabi. The entire lifetime of a Nabi. 
These are very righteous people, yet they are so terrified. What is going to be our state? We're going to be bewildered. So now, they come, he says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is narrating this. He's talking to the Sahaba. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the hadith. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking to the Sahaba, this lengthy hadith. He says, they will come to me and say, oh Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah. You are the seal of the prophets. Allah has pardoned all of your past and future. Intercede for us with your Lord. Do you not see our desperation today? In another version, he says, I will seek permission from my Lord and I will be granted. When I see Allah, I will fall prostrate before him. He will leave me in that position for as long as he wishes. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi will be allowed to intercede. He will fall into sujood. He says, I shall then set off. So once the people come to him, they ask him for the shafa. So then he, he starts moving from there. And he says, I come below the throne and I will fall, fall down in sujood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The arsh of Allah, he falls down in sujood. He says, Allah will reveal to me and inspire me with some of his praises and glorifications which he has not revealed to anyone before. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time will be given some type of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some words, some beautiful words. He says, these words have not been given to anyone. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time, he doesn't know what they are. They, these words are inspired by Allah. So it's like these words are so beautiful that Allah will answer the dua. No Nabi has that. Not even Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until that moment. So then he's going to fall into sujood and he says, as long as Allah wills. So who knows how long that sujood will be and what those praises are, how long those praises are. It, it doesn't have to be like one sentence. It could be very, very long and he's probably in sujood for a very long time. Then after he's praising Allah in sajda, he's doing it for us. He's not doing it for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the first time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak on Yom Al-Qiyamah. He'll say, O oh Muhammad, raise your head. Ask and you shall be granted. Intercede and it will be accepted. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will raise his head and he will say, My Ummah, O oh my Lord, my Ummah, my Lord, my Ummah, O oh my Lord. And another narration says, I will lift my head and I will say, My Lord, begin the reckoning for your creation. Start the Hisab. This is called the Shafa'a Uzma, the great Shafa'a. Then it'll be said, and this is like kind of skipping certain things. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying the rest of the hadith. It'll be said, O Muhammad, enter those of your ummah who have no hisab against them into the right gate of the gates of Jannah. These people will also share with other people the ability to go through other gates. So what's happening here? Once the shafa is accepted, Yom Al-Qiyamah can, or the hisab can begin. Yom Al-Qiyamah is the whole thing. The hisab, the reckoning can start. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's a special group amongst your servants, let them go through. They're going to skip everything else. They're going to go straight to Jannah. So the next phase of Yawm al-Qiyamah, this group of your followers, O Muhammad, let them, tell them they can pass. So they get a free pass. They don't have to go through the whole hisab. You know, people make dua, O oh Allah, enter us into Jannah without hisab. That's what they're talking about. So there's going to be a very elite, elite group of the creation of Allah this is the highest pinnacle that a person can reach. They will just skip everything. And to make a crude example, I think it's been oh, maybe two decades since I went to Six Flags. And you buy those little passes. How, how much are they now? Like 20, 30 bucks. But it's kind of worth it. Because you go to that, you buy one, this is like skip passes, I forgot what they're called. And then there's this like long line of people, they're waiting and they're tired and it's, they're leaning on stuff and switching foot to foot. And then you go to this other gate and you just look at them and smile. And then you swipe your thing and then you just cut all of them. And the line is so long that just cutting also is just taking a long time to walk through. And you do that over and over. So imagine that's just paltry, this useless stuff, getting in a roller coaster. But what about on Yom Al-Qiyam? When these people just watching all the other people like, bye guys, it's done for me. I'm going straight to Jannah. This is a special group of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah. You have to work for that. You have to work. Who, imagine who those people must be. Who are these people? 
If we can meet them, we'd be lucky. If I meet a person who goes into Jannah without Hisab, we're lucky. And that this should inspire you. Like, oh Allah, I want to be one of those people. So then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, by him in whose hand lies the life of Muhammad, the distance between the two doorways of the doorways of Jannah is as great as between Mecca and Himyat, or as between Mecca and Basra. So like from Saudi Arabia to Iraq, there's eight doors of Jannah. And so between each, these are huge gates, you know, giant gates. And between each is like hundreds and hundreds of miles distance. And the gates are going to be huge. Another hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that these gates have different names. And so there will be the gate of salah, the gate of jihad, the gate of zakat, the gate of fasting. And he says the, the name, he gives us the name of the gate of fasting is called rayyan. Rayyan means to be, to quench the thirst. Some people, they keep the name rayyan. It means the thirst has been quenched. So the people who used to fast a lot of nafal fasts, they will go through that gate. Then Abu Bakr, anhu, he was very like, he gave everything up in dunya, but he really wanted things in the akhirah. Like he wanted position, so he would work for it. That's what I'm urging us to do. Have this in mind. That I can sacrifice today so I can have it tomorrow. I'm going to get. I will receive. So Abu Bakr said that, is there anyone that like all the gates of Jannah will call them? And the gates of Jannah will call people. Like they'll talk. They'll say, come through me. You used to fast a lot. You can come through me. Or you used to stand in tahajjud a lot, you can come through me. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, yes, there are certain individuals, the gates, they, all of the gates will call this person. They, they, are, they will compete with one another. They want this person. And it's as if they all fuse into one and let that person go through all of them. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said to Abu Bakr that you'll be one that they'll do that for. You'll be amongst those that all the gates will want you to go to them. They'll all call you and you'll go through all the gates of Okay, so this is the grand shafa'a. Some lessons, and then we'll take a break, inshallah. Lessons from the hadith of shafa'a. The first is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he's the master of humanity. This is most clear on Yom al Qiyamah. It's so clear that there will be no one to doubt this. In today's time, there's so many people that, that make fun of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa as they did in his era, who do not follow him who are against him, who stay, who revile him. But on Yom Al-Qiyamah, those worst people will probably be in the for forefront begging him to start the Shifa. No one on that day will doubt him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show that he is the master of humanity. Master not as in like creator, that's Allah. But master as in the leader of mankind. He is the Sayyid of humanity. And a Sayyid is one who looks after his people. And that is what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does. Completely selfless. Now, why do these people go through various anbiya? Like they go to Adam, then Nuh, then Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why not just go directly to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So it seems that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will cause this group of people to forget. Or they, they won't know about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or the horrors of Yom Al-Qiyamah will cause them, like the best they could do is come up with, just go to Adam, he's the first. That's the, the, the limit of their rationalization. He's the first creation of Allah. Let's go to Adam. Then they're directed. Adam alayhi says, go, go to Nuh. So it's possible that the, the, the horrors of that day cause people to not really think too deeply. They can't. And they're saying, okay, my mind is just telling me, go, go to Nuh alayhi That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire Adam alayhi salam, will inspire Nuh alayhi salam to give them that mashwara. Of course, they know that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest, but at that moment, that's what comes to mind and on the tongue. So the, the, the hikmah behind it, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, you know, is, is doing this on purpose. He causes this. is to display further the greatness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if this group of people went directly to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there could be a doubt. That, well, okay, he could have done the Shafa, so could Isa Alaihi Wasallam, so could Musa Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Jews and the Christians start fighting. Yeah, but Musa alayhi could have done like, you know, a bigger shafa. No, Isa alayhi salam, son of God, you could have done this shafa. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear that no one can do the shafa. That's the hikmah that they go through all of these prophets. That don't, Adam can't do it, alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam can't do it. 
Ibrahim alayhi salam can't do it. Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, none of them. And so it shows the rank of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is what I said in the very beginning. Yawm al-Qiyamah is both a display of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power and, and something that we should be afraid of. And it's also a display of his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Every step of the way, you're just reminded what a great individual this is. There's nothing like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In, in the realm of the creation of Allah, there's nothing like Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is highlighted mostly in Yawm al-Qiyamah, every step of the way. Another thing I want to share is that the prophets and messengers, according to the vast majority of the Sunni Muslims, we state they are sinless. They don't commit sin. Right? So what we see in the Quran are mistakes of prophets. Yes, they make mistakes. They are human in that sense. They make a mistake, but it is not considered a sin. Because for a sin, you need to intend to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prophets never intend to blatantly disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you make a mistake, Today you're fasting. Tomorrow you're going to be fasting. Let's say you do wudu, and by mistake you gargle that water, and then you swallow that water. Your fast is going to be broken. That's breaking a fast. If you by mistake gargle water, and you drink that water, your fast is broken. You have to do qada after Ramadan. But is that a sin? It's not going to be a sin. Allah is not going to hold it against you. It was a mistake. It's wrong, but it was a mistake. So the Prophet ﷺ, anything that you see that is seems like a sin to you and I, it's of this type. They did not intend anything wrong with it. Musa ﷺ hit someone and he died. He was preventing him. It's like a push. This person, don't harm this other person. I'm going to protect him. But he's so strong that the guy died. So now he didn't intend murder. So he's not going to be written in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a murderer. So this is something that we should understand. And then we go into the Shafa'a Sughra, the lesser intercession. So I'm going to talk about this. Let's see if I can quickly mention this in the next six minutes. Then, inshallah, we can have a 20 minute break, inshallah, for you guys to freshen up, socialize, talk to one another. And then we'll resume at 1, I'm sorry, 2.10. Okay, so from 1.50 to 2.10. So now we go into the lesser intercessions. This is after, now when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did the Shafa'a, Uzma, Kubra, the main intercession, the Hisab, reckoning will begin. In the reckoning, you have various intercessions. So I'm not going to start the reckoning now It's because because the Shafa'a Sughra occurs within the reckoning. We're just going to talk about this right now. You just keep it in mind that when the reckoning occurs, there will be a chance for people to intercede. So what is a lesser intercession? Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. Salihin, righteous people, scholars, profav even, they will be able to do a intercession. Not to start the hisab. That's reserved for Rasulullah But this is to forgive someone. Maybe your spouse was not someone who was uh, pious. They used to you know, disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were a pious person. So you say, oh Allah, they're my spouse. Please, you know, if I have this position with you, please help them. Save them from the fire of Jahannam. Or my child used to disobey you, but you know, I, I ask you to forgive them. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept from a group of people. So there are various uh, different narrations for this. And I'm going to skip over them. So who you know, gets this, this ni'mah of intercession? So you and I cannot have the shafa'a uzma. Like you can't do it. This is something you have to ask of Rasulullah. But you can have one of the following. We should endeavor, if you want to help others as well, to be of the following categories, inshallah, and you will be able to intercede for others. And that's why some people say, like, you know, don't forget me on Yom Al-Qiyamah. When I became a hafiz, I have this uncle. Uh, he wasn't so pious before. Alhamdulillah, he's done hajj, and he's, he's, he's turned a new leaf. He has a beard and everything. He prays now. Uh, before, he used to, like, hold me. And, like, he, he had iman, though. He had yaqeen used to tell me, like, don't forget me. Like, choose me to be amongst those that you intercede for. And I don't even know if I'll have the intercession, but he was like, you're a hafiz, and I know the hafiz will be able to intercede. Don't forget me. Write my, write my name in the register. I told him, yeah, I'm, I have you in my register. Then some other uncle found out. He's kind of, like, more distant, not my direct uncle. He was like, can you write me in the register, too? I was like, I don't know. You're a distant uncle. You're my mom's cousin. He's my mom's brother. So I don't know about that. Like, I just smiled and said, oh, we'll see. 
But you know, I don't. The reality is, I need intercession myself. So I have to go ask some other people, like help me out. So anyway, let's talk about some of these different kinds of intercession. So these are not the people. This is like kinds of intercession that people will make. So righteous people can do intercession. Prophets can do intercession. And that's why I think I'll mention this later, but I'll mention it now. It is actually preferable for you and I to be good to righteous people. Like treat them nice. Like sometimes give them a gift or like just be as nice as you can to this person if you think they're pious. Because they'll remember that on Yom Al-Qiyamah and if they have the opportunity to do Shafa, if Allah gives them that opportunity, they'll probably remember you. And there are some narrations we'll, we'll talk about. That one pious person, he remembers this person, he's in Jahannam. This other guy's in Jahannam. And he says, oh Allah, that guy gave me water one day. Can you help him out? And Allah will take him out of Jahannam. Just because he gave him water. Imagine if you're really nice to different pious people. So we have like very pious elderly people in our community. Some scholars as well. So you go to them, you treat them nice, inshallah. And then in hopes. You don't, you don't have to say, hey, you know, this is for you to make intercession for me. You don't say it like that. Just treat them nice and they'll remember. You don't have to say this is for the intercession. So the first kind of intercession is intercession of direct paradise. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa will have this. Where after the main shafa'a, Allah will ask or tell him that take that group, the elite group, and you, you take them into Jannah. So he, like they will be able to get through. Now, we'll talk about this later when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is actually the first one to get into Jannah. So perhaps they'll be waiting somewhere. They'll be waiting perhaps next to the gates of Jannah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will stay back for you and I. He's actually going to stay back. He could actually go directly into Jannah. And that, you know, it's the end of it. But he stays back. So this group, the, in, in one hadith, it says 70,000. They will be allowed to go direct to paradise. So that's a shafa of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there's a, the shafa'a intercession of forgiveness. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, you know what, it's going to be 50 right now, so we'll, we'll take a break here, inshallah. And uh, I'm going to mention the kinds of intercession like we're doing right now. And then certain things, practical steps you and I can take to get the intercession, like to get intercession from people. So this is like practical things that we can employ, inshallah, from now on so that we can have the intercession of someone. So we're going to take a break here, inshallah. We'll pause and uh, you guys have some of the refreshments. And we'll continue in 20 minutes, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فإن شاء الله let's uh, get ready for the second portion sisters can uh, come and uh, we're just going to get started so I was talking about various kinds of intercession the one is the intercession of direct paradise and that is where Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم will want a group of people to go into Jannah without any hisab. And he'll be given this by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will touch on that later on when we're talking about the hisab itself. Another type of intercession is forgiveness. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us that various people will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have people's sins 
forgiven. And so it's like a, a lifting them up to a higher level of Jannah. So that'll be the intercession of forgiveness. So some people will be able to do this. And uh, this is kind of like what other people will have. So like we'll talk about various narrations of who can intercede, but that will be later on in the Hisab. So scholars, Kufav, righteous people, people who used to perform tahajjud, various types of people. And if they are interceding for someone who is not in the fire of Jahannam, they're, you know, they have to be a Muslim. Though. Bear that in mind. Right? So you can't intercede for someone who doesn't even fulfill the requirements of going to Jahannam. No non-Muslim will enter Jahannam. And it's not possible. Um, or like, you know, if there were a previous nation, if they didn't follow that Nabi, they won't enter Jannah. So that's like the condition. But a sinful Muslim who is like his level in Jannah is very low. So someone of a higher level can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them so they get a higher level. Then there's an the intercession of extraction. There's various ahadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about how people are in the fire of Jahannam. These are Muslims. We'll reach the portion of the Sirat, inshallah, the bridge that is over the fire of Jahannam. Some Muslims will fall in. So like, there's a bridge, it's very thin, and on the other side, it's a very long bridge. The other side is Jannah. And every human has to cross that. Any, any person, even jinn, you can't just skip that portion. So the people who go into Jannah without Hisab, they will also go over the bridge, but they'll go very quick, like in the blink of an eye. So they still cross, but in the blink of an eye, they're made to go like light speed. Some Muslims, that, that bridge is a manifestation of our actions. If your actions were like shaky, they were not so good, sins are more than actual actions, depending on whether Allah wants or not. But we are told that some Muslims will be on the bridge, it will be taking them years and years to cross, they won't be able to make it, and then they'll, they'll fall off. They'll fall into the fire of Jahannam. Jahannam is below, black fire. These Muslims will be in the fire of Jahannam. So there will be some people will intercede on behalf of them. And in various hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam keeps on interceding for them. And he's on the Sirat. We'll talk about it in detail when we get there, how selfless he is. He refuses to go to Jannah. He says, not until every one of my followers is out. So then he's going to keep on interceding, keep making dua for these people. And then every... So often, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause more and more to come out. Once all of them are out, then he'll, he'll, he'll open up Jannah. So we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there, inshallah. Then the intercession of ascension. This is a person getting a... He's already in Jannah. But due to someone's intercession, they get a higher rank in Jannah. So they don't really need forgiveness. They're in Jannah already. They're like very pious. They've made it. But let's say... Instead of, you know, floor 1,000, they're on floor, you know, 900. So, you know, just making random floors in Jannah. They say that for every ayah, there's another stage in Jannah, which means there should be around 6,000 different stages. So this person can, due to someone's intercession for them, they get higher. And in Surah Al-Hadid, I believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just paraphrasing, that the pious people will be given, their family will be made to reach their status. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands that we don't feel comfortable without our family. So he will allow, if you're pious, your family members to reach up to your status. So they might not have reached that status in Jannah. They were like a bad person or something like that. Or they, they got a lower status than you if you were very pious. Allah will allow you to make them come to your level. Similarly, if you have a pious family member, they can do that for you. Now, actions which will grant one intercession. So these are the following things we should try to do. And we are doing some of them, but now we should be cognizant that these things can get me the shafa'ah of Rasulullah of you know, various different aspects, but here we're going to mainly talk about the shafa'ah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have the main shafa'ah, but he will also be active in all these other shafa'ahs. Forgiveness, extraction, ascension, um, you know, all these ones that we just discussed. He will be very active in that. And he will do shafa'ah so much 
that no one can rival him. So on Yom Al-Qiyamah, the main thing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is doing is dua, doing a lot of dua, a lot of uh, intercession. It's like he's doing it for a lot of people. So you want to get his intercession, and that's going to be the best one. So you can. You don't even have to have seen him. How do we get this intercession of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The first is to make dua of wasila and the maqam mahmud for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the adhan. So every time you hear the adhan, the dua that follows, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma wa salati al qa'ima ati muhammadin al wasila wa al fadila wa ba'athu maqama mahmudan al ladhi wa'adta inaka la tuflifu mihan. Oh Allah, you are the Lord of this adhan and this call that was done. Give Muhammad the Maqam Mahmud and the Wasila that you have promised him. Indeed, you don't, do not break your promises. So we make this dua for that dua after Adhan is a dua for Rasulullah. Like I mentioned, you benefit from that. So we should do that. And if you do so, Nabi says in a hadith that you will have his intercession. So let me read this portion of the hadith. It has the whole dua in the hadith, it's in Bukhari various other ahadith. So it says, if you recite this dua, after every time you hear the adhan, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, my intercession for that person will be allowed on the day of resurrection. So this is one way you can get that from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two, visiting Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning, going to Medina and seeing the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to share some narrations that's mentioned in Sunan al-Bayhaqi and various other uh, books. He says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, There is no one who greets me except that Allah returns to me my soul so that I may return their greeting of peace. So if you go and you say salam to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this hadith, he's saying my soul comes back into my body. I'm aware of the salam, basically. And then I return that salam. You can't really hear it, but this is like Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returning the salam if you give the salam. Now, you can only do this if you're there. He's not talking about if you and I give as-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah from here. Uh, if you are in Medina, in front of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's qabr, and you say as-salamu alayka, that's what he's saying. In another narration, it says, every time Ibn Umar, who's the son of Umar, when he would return from a journey, he would enter the masjid, Masjid Nabawi, he would approach the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would say, "Peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. Peace be upon you, O Abu Bakr. And peace be upon you, O beloved father." His father's Umar. They're all buried there. So Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Bakr, Umar. So he gives salam to them. They've already passed away. So a lot of people make a big noise about this. How can you give salam to him? He's passed away. Well, we're told the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasallam are alive in their graves. The Siddiqs are also alive. And the Shuhada are also alive. It's in the Quran. The Shuhada are alive. At least the Shuhada part. That's in the Quran. But ahya'un inda rabbihim Do not consider the Shaheed to be dead. They are alive. They are given the rizq by Allah. So they have some sort of understanding. We don't know exactly how that realm works. But they're not like normal people. Shaheed, a Siddiq, and a Nabi. They're very different. So what we can glean from this hadith is that they have some sort of understanding. If you give salam, then they understand. Another hadith. He who passes away in one of the two harams will be resurrected with safety on the day of judgment. And he who visits me in Medina, expecting a reward, will be with me on the day of judgment. So visiting Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Masjid Nabawi. Another hadith in Tabarani. The one who comes to me visiting and is not moved to action except by the impetus of visiting me. Meaning the one who comes to visit Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only to visit him. He's moved. Like, I want to go to Medina to visit Rasulullah Sallallahu That's my niyyah. Then it is their right that I shall be an intercessor for them on the Day of Judgment. So this is, you know, motivation. So if someone is just going for Umrah, they go to the, uh, the, the, the Haram in Mecca, Haram al-Makki, and say that, you know, why go to Medina? I'm just going to do tawaf and umrah here. What do I got in Medina? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there and you can get the shifa too. So you don't want to miss that opportunity. It's so nearby. Why not go there? So go there 
and say to you know make a dua oh Allah you know allow me to go visit it's like you know as if he was alive we don't have Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before us but we can go see the grave blessed uh, Rawla and the Qabr that's one thing we can do another one is very difficult but some people when they make an earnest dua for this Allah gives it to them passing away in Medina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says whoever is able to die in Medina let him die there I will intercede for those who die in Medina. So it's like his city, the city of the Prophet. Medina used to be called Yathrib. It's in the Quran, Yathrib. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi went there, they just call it Medina to Nabi, the city of the Prophet. That's the whole name actually, Medina to Nabi. And in short, we call it Al Medina to Munawwara, the, the illuminated city. So this is his city. If you die in his city, he's going to make sure he intercedes for those people specially. So this is, uh, there's many other hadith, I'm just going to skip over it. But if you make an earnest dua to Allah, He can make it happen. We don't know our financial situations, perhaps it's not going to be allowing us to do that. But if you're earnest, Allah can make anything happen. Number four, continuous salutations. This we can do, especially on Fridays, we should give a lot of salutations to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi So in one hadith, this is in Ibn Majah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is reported to have said, present copious salutations upon me on Jumu'ah, for it is witnessed and testified by angels. So on Jumu'ah especially and throughout the week, you should have like, you know, you should have your azkar, you have different, you know, different amounts after Fajr, after Asr. It's a really good time for dhikr. So you'll have your la ilaha illallah, astaghfirullah. You should also have some portion of Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, these types of salutations. So he says, send a lot of salutations on me on Jumu'ah. The, the angels will witness it. They'll testify to it. He says, no one sends a salutation upon me, but that it is presented to me until they're finished. So meaning if you send Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, you say that angels take it from you. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a phrase, but it has a physical, metaphysical, I should say, form. And angels take it to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Every time you say it. So some of our teachers used to say, you should ponder over this. When you're saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, imagine angels taking it from you and presenting it to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you should say it like, you shouldn't be thinking about other stuff. When you're saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, think that I'm sending salutations upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then the Sahaba said, okay, you're saying that, he's talking to the Sahaba, anytime you give a salutation to me, the angels bring it to me. So they, the Sahaba, this is Abu Darda, he says, even after your death, even when you die, this will still be the case? So he said, indeed, Allah has made it haram for the earth to consume the bodies of the prophets. Therefore, the prophet of Allah is alive and well. It's part of, you know, the narrator saying that. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, basically, I won't be deteriorated. The Anbiya Alayhi Wasallam, their bodies don't deteriorate like ours. So hypothetically, if someone was able to see Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's body, it would be the same. It's just Allah protects that. You won't be able to see it. There's actually a story I read in the biography of Umar anhu when he was a Khalifa. Some people went to, you know, some Sahaba that were fighting in Persia. They went to this temple, this random temple, and they saw the body of someone dead there, like in the temple. And... Uh, the people of the temple were saying it's a noble person. So they found out that this was some prophet. I forgot which prophet. And then Umar who told them to dig various graves, bury him in one of them, and then hide all the graves. Like make many of them so no one knows which one he's in. And then they, they buried that prophet there. But if that wasn't a the prophet at the time, how many thousands of years ago did he pass away? So the, the earth doesn't deteriorate their bodies. In another hadith, he says, the, the one who is closest to me on Yawm al-Qiyamah will be the one who gave most salutations on me. Easy way. You say a lot of Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, various you know, ways to say it. The more you say it, the more closer you'll be to him. And if you're close to him, then you're successful. There's various, various, so many ahadith about this. But key is, have a daily portion so that you can get the shafa'ah. So those are four things we can do. I'll just summarize. Making dua after the adhan. Visiting Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. 
passing away in Medina and continuous salutations upon Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think we can easily do three of them. Passing away in Medina is kind of hard, but we can easily do three out of these four. Now, the intercession of prophets, angels, verifiers are Siddiqs, Siddiqs, scholars, ulama, martyrs, shuhada, righteous, salihin. All of these people will have opportunities to do intercession as well. So, in the Shafar al Kubra hadith, the, the major intercession, there's a portion of the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, call the Siddiqs. And then the Siddiqs will be allowed to intercede. Who's the Siddiq? Abu Bakr is a Siddiq, but there's others as well. So I've read uh, quotations of some great awliya, such as um, Imam, um, I forgot his name, uh, Ibn Atay al Iskandari. He says that I testify that Imam al Ghazali was a Siddiq. There's various Siddiqs in the Ummah. These are like very high level awliya. The highest level is the Siddiq. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, call the Siddiqs, or at least the angels will call it, say, say this, make this announcement. Then the Siddiqs will intercede. Then it will be said, call the prophets. Probably, you know, maybe this is not in a sequential order. Call the prophets. Then a prophet will arrive and have a group with him. And then another prophet will have five or six people with them. Then another prophet will have none with them. Then it will be said, call the martyrs. And then they will intercede for whom they wish, the shuhada. When the martyrs intercede, then Allah will say, I am the most merciful of those who show mercy. Enter into Jannah those who have not ascribed partners with me. And then they will intercede on behalf of them. But the condition is they shouldn't be mushrik, they shouldn't be a kafir. And there's various ahadith in this regard. So like I mentioned, we should try to be good to righteous people so they remember us on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And this is, you know, the, there's a very long hadith here. I'm just going to skip over it. In another hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, In my ummah, there are those people who will intercede for large groups of people. So there's people in the ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that will intercede on behalf of large groups. And among them, there are those who can intercede for a tribe. And among them, there are those who can intercede for a group. And among them are those who can intercede for a man until they're admitted into paradise. So some people will just be able to intercede for one person. So that's better. You know, if you're interceding, that means you're in a good situation instead of receiving the intercession. And some people, they can do it for huge amounts of people. Ali radiallahu anhu reports that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, if anyone recites Quran, memorizes it, declares what is lawful in it to be lawful, what is unlawful in it to be unlawful. Allah will bring them into paradise and make them an intercessor for 10 of their family members who deserve Jahannam. So what is he saying here? Hafil of Quran. And one who learns the contents of Quran, halal and haram, and avoids haram and follows the halal, that person will be allowed to intercede for 10 family members. So if you've memorized the Qur'an, then endeavor to be a strong Hafiz al-Qur'an, meaning you recite it constantly, try to keep it in memory, but also learn the contents. It's not enough that you just can rattle off the, the, the words and you don't know what it means. A lot of people, they can just say the Qur'an cover to cover. They don't know a single ayah what it means. That's not what he's talking about here. you understanding the contents. You're kind of like a scholar at that point. You understand the Qur'an. That person can intercede for 10 people who were supposed to go to Jahannam. It's huge. In one hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, people will be formed into rows on Qiyamah. A person among the people of the fire will pass a person and say, don't you remember the day you asked for water and I gave you a drink? Then the man will intercede on his behalf. And so just by giving someone water, he got shafa. Another man will pass another and say, do you remember the day I gave you some water for wudu? Like, yes. And then he will do intercession for him. Another person will say, do you remember the day you sent me on an errand and I did it for you? And then he'll intercede for him. But like I was saying, it's mustahab. It's preferable that you and I do good favors to good people in hopes like you don't tell them 
but in hopes that maybe they can do shifa for me if they got the opportunity. So that is regarding the uh, shafa, inshallah. And now we will move on to the hisab. We have about half an hour. We'll start with the hisab and that will continue tomorrow, inshallah. So now we're going to start talking about the reckoning. So this is what we did so far was a recap. And, you know, it's been a year. So I'm sure many of us have forgotten uh, all about all of this. So now is new material that we have not talked about before. This is where we left off last year. Some people, it's, it's been so long. It's a whole year. They were asking me, didn't we do all of Qiyama last year? Like, well, if you know all the contents, then that's great. You don't have to come. But we only did half of it. And so now this is the actual, the main portion of Yom Al-Qiyamah is the reckoning itself where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks questions. And then what happens after that, the final judgment. So all of that before is just resurrection, people waiting. The fact that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to intercede, then the intercession happens. Now is the ball starts rolling, stuff starts happening. So in that previous hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the Yom Al-Qiyamah is 50,000 years. And the standing portion is 25,000. So literally half of Yom al is done now. Now is the second half where a lot of stuff is going to happen. So now what is the reckoning? In Surah Tughafir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-yawma tujaza kullu nafsin bima kasabat la dhulma al-yawm inna Allah has sari'u al-hisab. Today every soul will be rewarded for what it has done. No injustice today. Surely Allah is swift in reckoning. I mean, today, everyone's going to get what's coming to them. You did good, you're going to get good. You did bad, you're going to get bad. That is Yom Al-Qiyamah, or that is the reckoning, I should say, Hisa. The reckoning is when people will be informed in depth regarding their actions, as well as the rewards or punishments based off of their actions. So this is extremely fearful. We should be extremely fearful. This is extremely scary. That the actions you and I have done, and you might have even forgotten about your actions, but they will be told to you again. You did this on this day. Do you remember? What, what is your answer? You knew this was wrong. Why did you do it? Oh, you did this on that day. That was very good. So it's a critique. It's looking at like a, a in-depth critique of the stuff that you and I did. And so Muslims believe in this. This is a real belief that you and I have very strong and firm belief. And it governs all of the things that we do in this life. It should. And if someone has this belief, you don't need police. You don't need rules and regulations. This person will lead a very good life. You know, a couple of years ago, a decade or two, there was like this blackout in New York. I don't know, some of you probably remember that. And then people went and looted places, stealing stuff. They said, you got hobos wearing Armani suits and like and people stealing TVs and everything, pandemonium, chaos. People were taking bats, breaking like stores, taking tuna fish cans, whatever they can get their hands on. It's ridiculous. So why is there any kind of you know, system in society? It's because they're afraid of police. Now, what if this police is always watching you, is there no matter what, is you know, recording everything you do? That's the belief of Muslims. So you can never act up. If your belief is very strong, there's never a moment when you're alone. Allah's always there. So imagine if there's a police officer everywhere you're, you are. And you, at night, you're using your phone. No one's watching what you're doing. What if there's a police officer standing there just looking at you? That's how you should feel. And on Yom Al-Qiyamah, in the reckoning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell you what you did. Which is terrifying. So now the reckoning is, is a very important part. This is like the major portion, major part of Yom Al-Qiyamah. There's going to be certain phases leading up to it, and then there's a major reckoning. So about six different phases in total. The last one is the actual reckoning. 
Number one is presentation. So being presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a human. Right? So this is after shafa'a. Now the, the major event is occurring. Number two, disputations. So people who had you know, issues with one another, they're going to take that out on against, they're going to argue with one another. There's going to be argumentation and stuff like that happening. Mostly for kuffar, for Muslims, you know, inshallah, they, they're not going to be worried about that, depending on your level and how many people you've harmed. Then the interrogation, the su'al, will be asked various questions. Did you have iman? No, yes, no. Even prophets will be asked certain questions. They're different than us. Prophet will be asked a question, but not the same that we have. Then a testimony. So a testimony will be given. Uh, this is, we'll get to that, where some prophets, their nations will lie about them. And so they need some kind of proof that they gave the message. And so some other people will be able to testify for the prophet. Then the book of deeds. There is a book that is being written. Right now, you can't see it. You have scribes writing down, like angels. But like, really, you're never alone. You have an angel writing down your good deeds, like, if you have this in your mind, how can you sin? The problem is we become negligent. We just become ghafil, we, we forget. And then we sin. He's, he's sitting there looking at what you're doing. And he's writing it down. And then we, we're doing ghiba, we're speaking bad about a person, looking at haram, listening to music, or listening to haram, whatever, you, what, what have you. And the angels are just sitting there, just writing it down. One day you're going to get that book. And in Surah Jubani Israel, which we recited already, Allah Ta'ala says, Iqra kitaba. Read your own book. You read it. You, you see. Is, is anyone doing oppression to you today? Just read your own book. Every one of us is writing a book. And you write it with your actions. It's being write, written down. You know, like in the past, you would dictate a book. A lot of the books that we study, some of the scholars, they dictated it. Meaning, they said it to someone. And then they had scribes, they would write it down for them. But they didn't actually write it. They said it and they wrote it. A very famous scholar in the Hanafi Madhab, Imam al-Saraqsi. He was imprisoned in a well, like an empty well, obviously. Like a really big, deep well. And he got in trouble with the king and he put him in the well. So he had really famous students or like really good students. And they still came to him when he was in the well. And they were like, teach us. So he said, start writing. And he dictated to them this huge book that's still the Hanafis study today. Al-Mabsuq, meaning the, the expanded book. He did it from his memory. He said, start writing. And then they wrote. So anyway, you are dictating a work to angels and they look at your actions and they write that down. For you. So you will be able to read that on your own team. Finally, the actual hisab, the interrogation. So Su'al is actually questioning, number three. And hisab is taking to account. So now let's talk about these various things. Firstly, the presentation before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفًّا They will be lined up before your Lord. Human beings are just going to be made in rows. In sufuf. You've come to us as we first created you. I mean, we created you bare. You didn't have any clothes. You had nothing. There's no, there's nothing. You're just a child. Now you come to us like that again. There's not, you don't have any wealth. You don't have any support. No clothes, nothing. You're just completely there. You thought that we didn't make this appointment for you. He's talking to Kufar here. You thought that you wouldn't have this day, but now, today, you're here. And when it happens, it's like, man, what was this like? It was just nothing. Because, you know, now if you think about your past, like 10 years ago, what was that? SubhanAllah, I see some of, the, some of you guys, I know you, for more than 10 years. And I remember maybe 20 years ago, you were a child, maybe like, you know, couldn't even speak. And I look the same as I look right now. 
The same way I look right now I used to look like that 20 years ago. Not maybe not 20 years ago, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, yeah. Or maybe even 20 years ago. I look the same way. So it's so ajib when you have this, the older people have this experience. You youngsters, you don't have this experience. You can't go, oh, 20 years ago, I was like this. You were in diapers. But the elders here, they can see, okay, 30 years ago, you look the same as you did now. But all of that just went. Where did it go? We can't say. Just gone into thin air at time. That's what happens when you look at your past. On Yom al the whole life, the whole dunya, just like, what was that? Just gone. All this stuff people chasing after, like Jordan shoes and this car and watching this anime. And stuff. What was that? Such a waste of time. And now the reality is here. We're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Terrifying. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Al-An'am, verse 94. وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ فُرَادَ كَمَا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Allah will say, Now you have returned to us alone as we first created you. You're not going to be with your you know, loved ones and all of this. Just alone. You have left behind everything we gave you. Nor do we see those intercessors of yours that you claimed were partners of God. These, these are people who did shit. People who did shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, where were all those, you know, you know, those gods that you used to worship? You said that they would bring you towards me. And, you know, some of the mushrikeen, they said that we need to worship these idols because they'll get us closer to Allah. Where are they? All the bonds between you have been severed. So like now you have husband, wife, father, son, daughter, uncle, friend, teacher. These bonds that you have, they're all gone. And those about whom you made such claims have deserted you. So like, you know, they used to worship different idols. Or maybe they used to worship malaika or jinn or whatever. They're going to desert you that day. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying, You're, you've come back to us. You know, we say, inna lillahi wa inna We are from Allah. He created us. He sent us to this world. And we will go back to Allah. This is going back to Allah. This is a hadith in Kanzul Ummal. Kanzul Ummal is the largest book of hadith we have in today's time. In the past, they used to have various other books. So they didn't survive, or you know, people had many more hadith memorized. But the largest collection available in today's time is in Kanzul Ummal. So this hadith states: Indeed, Allah will say on the day of Qiyamah in a raised, beautiful voice, "O oh my slaves, I am Allah. There is no god but me." I am the most merciful of those who show mercy. I am the most just of those who judge and the quickest to take account. O oh, my slaves, there is no fear upon you today. Neither will you grieve. These are obviously pious people he's talking to. Provide your proofs and bring your answers for you will be questioned and taken to account. O oh, my angels, stand in straightened rows by their feet for the reckoning. So this is scary. He's making an announcement though. If you're a pious believer, don't fear. He's like, you know, making you feel comfortable. But then he also says, it's time. Get your answers ready. You're about to be asked. It's terrifying when you think about this. You, Allah will talk to you and he will say this to, to all of us. Now, get ready. Think about your entire life and provide excuses, answers. Do whatever you can. Argue for yourself. It's, it's basically going down now. This is very scary. Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, weigh yourselves before you are weighed and take yourselves to account before your account is reckoned. Meaning if you do this in dunya, you take account of yourself now, you won't have to worry then. What does that mean? It means that every single night before you sleep, you look at what you did in the day. If you did something bad, ask Allah to forgive. If you hurt someone, you, you rectify that. So on a daily basis, you are removing the things that are negative in your account to zero. Every single night, you turn it back to zero. You did 100 bad things today. Put it back to zero. Do tawbah, istighfar every night. So then when you die, if it was a sudden death, maybe, maybe you only have five things you need to answer. But what do we do? We just let it pile and pile and pile thousands of things that we have to answer for. We didn't rectify. 
If you do tawbah though, you, you tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask Allah, I've done this wrong, please forgive me. You do that now, you won't have to do it then. But he says, Umar says, weigh yourself before your weight. Take yourself to stock. Take yourself to account before your account is reckoned. For your reckoning tomorrow will be lightened by your reckoning yourselves today. So this is a clear action that you and I need to start doing. And beautify yourself for the great presentation. On that day, you will be presented in a way that there will remain nothing of you hidden. This is from Surah Al-Haqqa, he's quoting. So Umar radiallahu anhu was saying that, how do you prepare for the reckoning, for the hisab? You start doing hisab now. What sins have I done? What good have I done? Praise Allah for it. What sin have I done? Seek his forgiveness. Did I harm this person? Fix it. Do whatever you can to solve all these issues. Am I in debt? Fix it. All the different things that I've done. If I've done ghiba and I hurt this person's feelings, fix that. And he says, beautify yourself for that day. So also make yourself beautiful. How do you beautify yourself for Allah? You exercise, put on makeup, wear nice clothing. No, Allah doesn't care about that. He is looking at your heart. Beautify your heart. Remove all of these negative traits that we have. Jealousy, rancor, malice, arrogance, greed. Remove that and put the opposites in. That's how you beautify yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is some advice from Sayyidina Umar. The great scholar Abdul Wahhab al-Sha'arani, rahimahullah, he said, As for the pre presentation before Allah and Qiyamah, it's like the presentation of an army in front of a king. So you'll be made to stand in rows. You can't move. Like, you know, no one will dare to, like, fool around. You know, even, like, you have all these jokers and stuff like that. Like, they like, they have this uh, naughty aspect about them. When they're supposed to do something like form rows, they'll, like, make a joke. They think they're, they're really cool by doing that, by being rebellious. You know, everyone has that phase. Some people just stays with them for a very long time, uh, staying immature. On that day, people are going to be terrified. Won't be immature like that. So it's like an army standing in front of the king. Because the, any soldier knows if I act up right now, he's going to chop my head off. So he's going to be scared. So it says, a slave will be made to stand in the presence of his Lord as befits his majesty. So we say in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know, we're not supposed to, as a Muslim, make an image of Allah in your mind. Don't do that. Don't try to think, okay, what does Allah look like? Some believers, believers will be able to see Allah. On that day, you'll find out what it means to see Allah. But right now, don't try to think of Him as something. It's not right. Because then, that thing that you see, that when you're trying to imagine Allah, you're going to be doing sujood to that, but that's not Allah. So don't try to Im imagine Allah is my advice. Right? Because in your mind, you're like, okay, this is your image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you do ibadah, you're doing a ruku' and sujood, you're thinking of, of some image, is that Allah? That's not Allah. So you're not going to be truly worshipping Allah in that situation. And so avoid those kind of things. But anyway, that's why he says, and all scholars say this, as befits his majesty. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever he means by it, that's what he means. He says the interrogation will take place as Allah wills for that slave. And Imam Abdul Wahhab al-Sha'arani says, Oh, what will be his condition when the flesh will fall from the faces from the immense amount of shame and embarrassment in front of Allah? That's, that's like, you know, what we need to think about. How shame, ashamed will we be and embarrassed before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's the creator of the universe. This is not like our mother or father. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows already everything we did. He says, you know, from the embarrassment, you'll feel like the, the flesh of your face is just falling off. So this will occur as befits Allah Ta'ala's majesty. Now, there's going to be three levels of the presentation. So what we're talking about, remember, we had a six little step breakdown. The first is being presented before Allah. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, People will be presented on Yom Al-Qiyamah in three presentations. The first two will be the presentation of argumentation and denial. As for the third, that will be when the books are distributed in their hands. Some will take them with the right hand and some with the left. So here, 
you know, he, he breaks it down into three groups. The first is people disputing. The second is people making excuses. And the third is the book of deeds. That, that's basically the order in which things will happen where people will be uh, interrogated or before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is disputations, argumentation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Zumar, verse 31. Then on the day of resurrection, you will dispute with one another in the presence of your Lord. So people will dispute. So now, what is these disputations? These are things that you did wrong to another person or they wronged you. Imagine, like this is a court system. It's a court case, basically. So if you've done wrong to a person, they take you to court. It's not just you and the person. It's not just a plaintiff defendant. There's a judge there. So how scary is it that, you know, you will have to answer. If you've wronged someone, that person will take you before Allah and you have to give an answer. Allah is the judge. And if you are wrong on that day in court, what do you do? You give, you give a certain amount. Oh, the person's suing you, so you pay that. You'll get sued as well. We're really terrified of getting sued for people with the business. How do you get sued on Yom Al-Qiyamah? What do they get? They get your amal. They get your deeds. So they won this court case in front of Allah. They're going to get that, that amount of good actions. And some people say, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, if a person wins that lawsuit against you, what type of actions are they getting from you? Accepted ones. They're not going to get rejected actions. From you. So think of this. How much we've been standing in taraweeh, how much fasting we've been doing, it's not easy. It's very difficult. Knees hurt, back hurts, hunger, thirst, tired, tiredness throughout the day. Amongst these ibadat, maybe some won't be accepted. You didn't have a class, it was like weak, you didn't fast nicely, you looked at haram. It's not going to be so valuable. On Yom Al Qiyamah, they're not getting those from you. They don't want none of that. They want some good a'mal that you did. That fast that you did was really hot and you struggled and you just barely made it, they're going to take that one. That taraweeh where you were tearing up and the imam was reading beautifully and you just felt so connected to Allah, that's the one they'll take. That tahajjud no one saw, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw, you made that beautiful dua, that's the one they'll take. And that's terrifying because how many of those do we even have? And they're going to start taking that. And there's a hadith that say that if you run out of those, don't think, that, okay, I don't even have anything. So in the court case, if I get sued, I don't have any money. So what are you going to do? I'm bankrupt. So good luck. Yom al is different. He has sins. What he'll do is, he won the lawsuit, and he'll say, oh Allah, he doesn't even have any good actions. He's like, you know, horrible act. This person didn't even do good actions. So Allah Ta'ala will say, okay, you have sins, right? Yeah, I got some bad sins. I got stuff that I don't want you know, anyone to hear about. It's horrible things. Okay, give it to him. Give him that horrible sin that you don't want anyone to see. Now it's on his record. Give him another one. Give him another one until your lawsuit is done. So this is really scary stuff. You need to solve your issues today before you die. Whatever it is, get it done. You've harmed someone. And there's details about this as well. For instance, and um, maybe I won't go too, too much farther. If you've done ghiba to a person, scholar state, if they don't know about it, don't tell them that you did a ghiba. Just do good to them. And make dua for them. Why? Because when you tell someone, hey, I did a liba of you, they're going to say, what did you say? You know, just forget about that. But, like, you know, I did a liba, so I'm asking you for forgiveness. No, I won't forgive you till you tell me what you said. Then you tell them what you said, and then they get really angry at you, and then they'll never talk to you again. So then you just messed up the whole situation. Instead, they don't know about it. You basically give them gifts. You get nice to them. And whoever you did the ghibah of them to, you speak good about them in front of that person. So say, for instance, I speak, speak to Abdullah, and I'm speaking about Zayd. Zayd is dumb, and he's like this, and like that. And Abdullah is like, ah, you know, why are you saying all this? Like, who cares? But, you know, Zayd is, the whole thing is Zayd is a horrible person, and I'm great. So then, now Zayd doesn't know. Abdullah didn't even tell Zayd. So I shouldn't go to Zayd and be like, hey, Zayd, I did a ghibah, please forgive me. Because then Zayd is going to say, okay, what did you say? And then I let him know all this. He won't forgive. 
Instead, what I do is I go to Zayd and I treat him very nicely. I give him some gifts. I be very good. Then I go to Abdullah and I say, Abdullah, the other day what I said about Zayd, I'm wrong. And what I said is a testimony and a fact that I am a horrible person. Zayd is actually a really good person. And I really hope that this stays between you and I. And I'm very shameful for what I did. And uh, I ask Allah to forgive me. That's what you should do. If Zayd, however, finds out I did ghibah, Zayd knows now. Now I have to go to Zayd and say, hey, I'm sorry. Here's a gift and this is what I have to do. Make amends. So that's an example. There's various things. Sometimes we have tools and stuff like that we borrowed from someone for so long, they forgot that we have it and we believe that it's ours now. It's so long. They have to come and ask us to borrow it again. So that's actually their property. Another thing, inheritance. And I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the Bengali brothers and sisters because that's my community. I know, culturally speaking, sisters are not allowed their inheritance in Bangladesh often. Except, illa mashallah, very, you know, uh, dindar people, religious people, they give their sisters their share. But I've been told from what I've experienced that if a sister comes to, you know, their father passed away, she comes and she will not even say to her brother that she wants inheritance. She'll get shunned, she'll get, you know, exiled from the family. So, so you want your inheritance? Here it is, and don't ever show your face here again. This is my property. The brothers will say. And we talked about this before. What, what is the punishment? That belongs to that sister. That amount that the brother took without her ijazah and permission, as far as it goes in the land on, underneath the earth, that much will be put on his neck. He's going to enjoy that. He enjoys it now. He's chilling on that property. He's going to be That property will be chilling on him. It's real. But this is what's happening. He will do zulam on their sister's. Such that Mufti scholars have stated, even if she says, I give it to you, it's not allowed because she's only saying that because of the custom. She actually wants it. She's terrified to, to, to ask for it. So if you fear Allah and you fear Hisab, you will give your sisters their, their amount. I'm not saying anyone here, but I'm saying in general. That's an example. There's many such examples of this that we do, and we don't even think twice about. And I, I think every family goes through this sometime in their life about inheritance law. But anyway, I'll finish with this. Ibn Abbas, he says about this verse, the truthful will dispute with the liars. The oppressed will, uh, will dispute with their oppressor. The guided ones will dispute with the misguided. And the weak will dispute with the proud. So basically, argumentation in front of Allah, that's going to happen. It's a court court system. Yom al is like court. And so tomorrow, inshallah, we'll start talking about this. Like Things that happen in the dunya, will we even remember them? Yes. You're going to remember them. And people, if you've wronged them, they're going to come to you. And if you've wronged people, or I'm sorry, if someone wronged you, you can take that from them. So like, you know, I had some friends, like I'll tell you an incident that happened to me. I was in madrasa, and I had these Nike flip-flops. It was nice stuff. And then after, like, you, you put them in the, the rack. And over there, we don't have, like, you know, indoors and, like, nice, like, even outside is, is like, nice uh, cement. Over there is, like, rocks and gravel and stuff. Like, you need your shoes. So one day, I, I come out of salah, and then I'm looking for my sandals. I can't find them. They're gone. And I wait, and I wait, and I'm like, maybe someone, you know, mistook them or something. Everyone leaves, and then they're gone. So then I felt so bad. And then, you know, some words probably came out of my mouth that, you know, we'll see on your own piano. And then some of my friends were like, no, you shouldn't say something like that. No, you can. You can absolutely say that. Why? Because it shows your iman that I believe in this and this person has wronged me. I have a right now. You can't be forced to overgo your right. Now, it is good to forgive. I forgave that person, whatever. It was a sandals. But at the moment, I was upset. And I have that right. Allah has given it to me. So you can't tell me, don't for, you know, you have to forgive. I don't have to do anything. I believe in a justice system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me that right and I'll take it from him. So that, that's allowed. Now, is that the best situation? We'll talk about some narrations where, you know, if you forgive, you'll be given a reward from Allah. But otherwise, you can do it totally. 
So that gives you patience. In dunya, knowing that I can take my right on Yom Al-Qiyamah, that gives you patience. A believer should have sabar. So what's happening in Philistine? You, you're going to go tell them, like, no, just forgive. They killed your family, everything, your house got exploded. These people just walking around, they, they shot you with the missiles. They, they should forgive. Not at all. There is a Yom Al-Qiyamah and they have a right. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to us, so why not take it? Now, if they want to forgive, their heart is filled with forgiveness, That's they're allowed to do that. But if they don't want to forgive, they're allowed to do that. So the key is that you should be terrified of all of those that you and I have wronged. And if someone has wronged you, then understand that have patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. We're going to pause here, inshallah. We will continue this tomorrow regarding the hisab. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us taqwa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify our affairs, allow us to turn a new leaf, to fix whatever we have to fix before we die. Sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Rahmatika ya 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 rahmat